Hi, and welcome to SIBO Digital TV, where we talk about all things crypto. I'm Catherine Kirkpatrick, Chief Legal Officer of SIBO Digital. And today I have with me Ulta Andoni, who's the General Counsel of Enclave Markets. Ulta, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me here. Let's kick things off with hearing more about you. Tell me more about yourself, how you made it to crypto, and tell us all about Enclave Markets. So first, I joined uh, Enclave Markets last year, which is a subsidiary of our parent company, Avalanche. And prior to that, I was chief legal officer of Nifty, so NFT platform. And then, uh, of course, I've been in private practice for many years now, mostly practicing at my very early career, you know, the uh, in intellectual property and address law. And then later, I first jumped into the blockchain technology as a professor, as an acad- academic, because I was lecturing law students, and I saw a lot of interest, especially in the technology. After that, which I think was super helpful for myself to understand better the benefits of the technology, I started representing clients uh, in the blockchain and crypto industry. And then, as I said, I started in-house. I think it's absolutely essential to really understand the tech if you're going to be practicing law in crypto. Absolutely. I understand Enclave Markets is a fully encrypted exchange. Can you talk a little bit more about that and the difference between that and a centralized exchange or a decentralized exchange? Yeah, so we are the very first fully encrypted exchange and our model wanted to embrace the performance of traditional finance with the governance uh, of decentralized finance. And I think it's going to be a priority for crypto exchanges to embrace the principles of crypto, which is governance government's decentralization, confidentiality, and also security. And uh, we just wanted to address those issues that we saw in 2022, as we were both very much aware of the big fallouts, because they were mostly as a result of relying on centralized actors. So the model of the exchange actually is concentrated on two key Uh, features or structures is the secure enclave and the attesters network. Some might call that the adjudicators uh, network. But the secure enclave is the uh, the enclave that kind of runs the code base of the exchange. And the attesters are independent nodes that help in that decentralization process. So they run their own nodes. They have to approve the code changes. We rely on them even, I mean, if we were to proceed with any stops in the exchange. So us as uh, as operators of the exchange, we do not have control over funds. And why do I say that? Because the model of the exchange is decentralized custody, which these attesters definitely help a lot with this decentralized custody. Uh, So we just cannot control uh, the funds of our clients. That's fascinating. And you made an excellent point. In 2022, back when I was a DeFi GC, there was initially, at least, a misperception that a lot of the volatility stemmed from DeFi, when in fact, a lot of the bad actors were really CFI or centralized finance. Would you say that that volatility informed the enclave market strategy? Uh, we didn't want to do this uh, or or to to rely on this model just by simple, uh, simply changing management or, or processes. We just wanted to rely on the hardcore technology. So uh, I think, as you mentioned, I think the big failure of centralized platform has been re- uh, relying or having that single point of failure. And this is exactly what we wanted to address with the model of our exchange. That makes perfect sense. And so obviously you've thought through the structure and are trying to kind of integrate a lot of good things from various models and structures. Anything else you think about when you think about risk management? I think it's very important, not only for my exchange, but for all exchanges to to have a risk-based approach strategy. And uh, that's exactly, I'm also chief compliance officer of our exchange. So uh, we do implement a risk-based approach uh, and we think highly about regulatory compliance, but also data privacy. And I think that these are both very important factors that uh, all exchanges should thrive to kind of integrate or or trying to find the perfect balance. We say the perfect balance, which I think that perfect balance is very hard to be achieved, but uh, definitely is a priority. So yes, we do have robust KYC AML process in place. 
Ulta, you mentioned AML KYC. For our viewers who aren't as well-versed in crypto legal and compliance, that's anti-money laundering and know your client, which is used by regulated entities to guard against money laundering, sanctions, and other risk-oriented violations. We use many tools regarding blockchain uh, transaction monitoring. And uh, of course, we do KYC. We, we perform due diligence on institutional users and also on retail users because, I mean, that is the way how we'd like to mitigate the risk for our exchange. I think that probably a lot of exchanges are moving in that direction. It's becoming more and more untenable to have no infrastructure guarding against risk, especially existential risk, like facilitating the flow of dirty money and the like. Absolutely. And I think we're going to see a lot of more of those models, but I have seen, uh, especially lately, which is completely obvious considering regulatory here uh, uh, in United States, uh, but uh, I'm sure that we're going to see a lot of more exchanges embracing that model. Absolutely. And how do you feel about this regulatory environment? Uh, <laughs> what do you see in the near or, or far term? I mean, are you positive about the outlook domestically, overseas? Uh, I, uh, unfortunately, I just uh, can say that I'm very uh, optimistic about our regulatory uh, environment here in the United States. Uh, personally, uh, or not personally, but for our exchange, I am, uh, uh, I am considering offshore, and we have a couple of uh, applications out there, which I think probably that's the best way to do, and in order to, to uh, I mean, for us to be successful, it is unfortunate fortunate that we are not uh, being a sort of uh, appreciated here in the United States, and not only us as an exchange, but us as an industry. But thankfully, as you know, there are two bills uh, in Congress. I think that uh, after Ripple decision, and we can talk more about this, definitely uh, the acting from Congress is going to be a very high priority for our industry to give our industry a lot of clarity that we are in much need of. I think that decision has spurred a lot of discussion, and I assume that the legislators are also considering that as part of their uh, you know, consideration of all of this pending legislation. But let's talk more about that for a second. Ripple. It was a big day for me. I'm sure it was a big day for you. It was a big day for all of crypto to get this decision that came as a surprise to many. Tell me more about your reaction to Ripple and how that may have changed things or may have not changed anything for you. You you said it right, Catherine. It was a big day for all of us because we've been in this industry for so many years. So, and especially for us watching the Ripple uh, case so closely, uh, it was a very exciting day. And uh, but then when you start re because of course the hype lasts only two <laughs> two days or three days, and then when you go and read the decision closely, I personally left. Um, I mean, after that reading, I was left with a lot more questions. And uh, I think definitely, as I said, it's super beneficial for our industry, but I am not sure where do we go from here. I think that I had a hard time personally to kind of navigate the judge's ruling, especially, I mean, in the Howey analysis. And as she mentions in the ruling, she's not considering secondary sales and how Howey test is applicable to secondary sales, which... I mean, definitely, that's exactly the big question mark for our industry right now. So for her to not analyze uh, the secondary sale, the application of how it tests to secondary sales, I think that that is going to, to bring a lot of more questions. And uh, I do expect that the SEC is going to appeal, uh, but there's, I, I, I think that we are far away to kind of uh, jump on, uh, you know, permanent conclusions uh, as an industry based on the Ripple decision. I think those are great points and said like a well-informed lawyer who actually understands the decision. I had been having a number of conversations with other attorneys in the space where there seems to be a lot of misinformation and a lot of misleading headlines that this is a clear win for one side or the other, but there's lots of facets to it. And a lot remains to be seen with, with other cases, for example, and the future of this case. So very good points. That brings me to a slightly tangentially related question. How do you think about coin listing for exchanges right now? Obviously, Ripple muddies the water to some degree. 
Is Enclave Markets considering XRP? You know, what? where is your head at in terms of coin listings? Uh, and of course, I mean, we discussed internally, but I didn't feel that uh, for my exchange, at least, that was the best decision. As I said, there are so many question marks left. So I don't think that we're going to jump uh, right now and, uh, and list Ripple. And um, we do have a coin listing policy. Actually, I call that or I, I drafted that mostly as a digital asset vetting policy, which is an internal document that we always go back. We refer to that document. We uh, evaluate the regulatory conditions in the United States. We evaluate our competitors and what they're listing. And we evaluate, I mean, if we're to add more coins, uh, we do go into a deep analysis into the project launching that digital assets. And if I see any red flags, even from, I mean, you have to go deep, actually, when you do this analysis, like even going back to the founders of the project and see whether or not there are any red flags there about AML compliance or sanctions, etc. Or I mean, other uh, uh, legal concerns that probably uh, might impact our decision about whether or not we have to list that digital asset. But I think it's important for companies to have a digital asset vetting or token listing policy. I personally don't think that the third party opinions that we used to do or our clients used uh, to ask us for mm -hmm. are, so, are much beneficial right now. Uh, so... Uh, and I, I don't rely, to be honest, on third party opinions. I think that this is a very important step by step analysis and should be a very uh, involved uh, and, uh, I mean, continuous internal process. I had another question. You know, what's interesting about Enclave Markets is, as you mentioned at the beginning, it's a subsidiary of Avalanche. And as you might know, SIBO Digital is a subsidiary of SIBO Global Markets. It's a little different, though, because you know, SIBO Global Markets is a is a TradFi entity, whereas digital is crypto, and Enclave and Avalanche are both crypto. Do you see that as an advantage? Are you able to collaborate and coordinate with your parent on strategy? Uh, yeah, so Avalanche actually is a software company. And we are a uh, and we are institutional grade digital asset trading platform, but has been uh, and and of course I mean we are built on Avalanche and actually the the idea of the secure enclave came from the engineers, the amazing engineers I would call of Avalanche. So that's how uh, we are actually we're a subsidiary of Avalabs, yeah. which uh, yeah, uh, but uh, definitely has been super helpful to be part. Uh, and to collaborate with uh, the parent company. I was actually uh, deputy general counsel of uh, Avalabs when I started building, uh, I mean, uh, building uh, enclave markets, and then I jumped in as a general counsel. That's fantastic. Well, you know, I know that we're running short on time, so I had two more questions for you. First, anything we haven't covered or anything you want to add to this discussion? I think that it's very important for all of us to 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 always uh, highlight the importance and the benefits of the blockchain technology. We just had this discussion before. It seems like there are so many critics out there of the blockchain technology thinking that blockchain technology is not a good technology, which uh, definitely, uh, I mean, not only that is a very uh, bearish st statement, but it's a big statement to make without knowing the, I mean, how many use cases, as you know, our friend Rebecca Reddick, I'm going to have actually Twitter spaces with her uh, this week. So she built this whole uh, database with all the use cases of blockchain technology. So it's interesting that we're still being hit with, uh, or we have to explain in sort of a protective mode, the benefits of this technology, which uh, honestly, after I've been for seven or eight years right now in blockchain technology, and I still find that... Um, uh, kind of hurtful as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Misinformed at Misinformed best. Misinformed at best, exactly. You know, you make a great point, and I need to give you a shout out. Ulta and colleagues, I think spearheaded by Ava Labs, have a whole series. Owl explains it all. I love this series because I think that the mission of it is really to educate people about all the facets of crypto and blockchain. Anything else you want to yes. 
tell viewers about that resource? I'm just so excited. So this was uh, uh, our idea, uh, general counsel of Avalabs and the other, of course, the legal team at Avalabs and myself. Uh, we, we just saw the need for so much more education out there. And first, uh, we had this idea to uh, to just deliver the informational uh, and 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 even to kind of debate those concepts in order or blockchain concepts in order to to help the audience with a better understanding. But now we have been growing so much, and we have been having. Uh, I mean, so far we have had many podcasts, Twitter Spaces. I think I'm very much uh, happy, and and I look forward to the future of Alex explain because it's a growing campaign and we are also trying to overreach uh, internationally and we do have a big presence internationally as well. Uh, as I said, this is only an uh, educational campaign, but we love for regulators sometimes. I myself have invited regulators for interviews on our podcast and I think that's very important, I mean, to spread the word and to educate people, especially legislators, on the benefits of the blockchain technology. I totally agree. I still think that there's a bit of an education gap, especially in areas that might be a bit more specialized like DeFi. And the more that we can do to educate everyone about the promises of this tech, separate and apart from financial services oriented crypto, the better for the ecosystem. Absolutely. And it's important, like even for when we deliver this uh, educational content, it's important to make it uh, in in uh, easier or in a way that is very uh, yeah easy to digest yeah. because we already having a hard time explaining blockchain to legislators, so we better do a good job with simplifying those main concepts of uh, blockchain technology. Well, last question, we like to ask all guests this question. What is your kind of craziest prediction uh, in the next 6 to 12 to 18 months of crypto? What do you see happening? Uh, that maybe you hope is going to happen or you hope not is going to happen. Give Definitely. us some, give us some, uh, an <laughs> inside of your head. Yes, yes. So uh, I hope that we're going to have an EDF. I think that that is going to be a big, big uh impact for the whole industry. And it seems uh, that we are a bit closer than we were last year. So I think, uh, and I do expect hopefully uh, EDF approval by next year. And uh, I hope that Ripple decision, uh, uh, one side of me thinks that uh, I hope that the SEC appeals because that way we're gonna have a lot more clarity along that process. I, I, I think probably we may end up even in front of Supreme Court with this decision, but that is going to be again, super helpful for our, uh, for our industry. Uh, you, you still see a lot of projects building and I still expect a lot of projects building. So I think now we're past that, definitely past the ICO era. Uh, I mean, where you see projects just to make a profit. I think now everybody's concentrating more on the technology and also trying to deliver best projects from that technology. I totally agree. I'm with you and fingers crossed on the uh, Bitcoin ETF as SIBO has now filed five. Yep. So I'll be with you and, and yes. cheering and, there. And, and I'm cheering for you as yeah. well. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Ulta. And thank you so much to our viewers. Uh, we'll see you next time on SIBO Digital TV.